The large apple orchards in our area near Chesham were planted about a hundred years ago. During the last two years they've gone. This one was at the end of Grove Lane where my farm is. When I was a boy, pudding almost always meant apple pie, apple dumplings or stewed apple. But people don't eat so many cooking apples these days. And if people don't eat them, my neighbours can't grow them. Now potatoes grow where the trees used to be and it doesn't look so pretty. Who changed the view? The farmer or the people who don't buy apples? You feel now that the population, the urban population, isn't on your side anymore. In times of war and afterwards, they were definitely on your side. They, they wanted, they were worried about their own food, and so they were prepared to be sympathetic towards farmers changing their methods uh, from traditional methods that looked picturesque to modern ones that didn't look so picturesque. Now, there's no sign of a shortage of food in the Western world. And therefore, people look on the countryside no longer as somewhere to grow food. They think, look at it as somewhere where they will enjoy themselves at the weekend. And the view becomes more important than the product. For me, this field of poppies provides a dramatic example of the conflict of view between farmers and the rest. Is it beautiful or is it a disaster? I saw it from over a mile away. And when I arrived, there was a queue of urban people taking pictures. Cars passing by would stop and admire. But it doesn't seem that way to the farmer. To him, it represents a failure. Either a failure on his part, he dropped his guard and didn't do what he should have done, or a failure of science in that the spray that he thought was going to kill the poppies didn't. Either way, a, a failure which he'll be somewhat ashamed and wish to hide up, perhaps, and he'll lose quite a lot in his crop by it. In fact, he burnt it all to prevent the poppies seeding. Mostly nowadays, weeds and flowers only survive around the edges. The sprays we use on the crops work, and it all looks different. We're not the only ones who are changing the countryside. What was a small rural community has been altered dramatically in my lifetime by improved transport. Now we're almost an outer suburb of London. For the most part, these people don't work here. They live here and would like to come home to a countryside of apple blossom and poppies. That's why they came. But they've made changes too. This was an open common grazed by sheep and with just a few golden gorse bushes in the spring and raspberries in the summer. You could see right across it. The sheep went because of the traffic and thorns and oaks sprang up. Homes have been built round the edge and what was the blacksmith sells lawn mowers. The pub has plowmen's lunches, but not a plowman in sight. People come from miles around to enjoy the fresh air and what's left of the countryside. If it wasn't for the space kept clear for the golfers, the whole common would revert to the forest of 2,000 years ago. Since the war, the population of Chesham has more than doubled, and there are houses where fields used to be. This is Gooseacre, though there aren't any geese there anymore. The farmhouses have been gentrified, and the land sold off to neighbouring farmers. This was four farm labourers' cottages, Today it's one big house. Now it's the turn of barns and other old buildings. A very first memory where I slept in, in Little Grove over the way, I could see when the leaves went on the trees, just a big black building. And it was the barn that we're now converting. Built, the authorities say, in the 17th century, as a thrashing barn. In those days, every farm would have a thrashing barn. And for the whole of the winter, the, the men would be employed in thrashing the corn by hand there. It was too narrow to use for modern implements. Our first rain dryer went in it and nearly shook it to pieces. And uh, uh, two years ago, it was going derelict. And the authorities came and served an order on me that it was a scheduled building and mustn't be allowed to fall down. So I discussed with them what to do. And they said, well, you mustn't allow it to fall down. If you do, you'll be prosecuted very probably. But on the other hand, you could preserve it by converting it into a house, and we will support you with the local planning authority. This is happening all over the place here. So now, the only building 
to dwell in that you can now build in this green belt area is a barn converted to a house. That's the only form of extra dwelling you can provide because they want you to preserve it because black wooden buildings have now suddenly become beautiful. They weren't built by architects to be beautiful. They're purely functional buildings. The house at Grove Farm, where I live now, has been through several stages. From a house, it was converted to a barn, and then, some say, a chapel. 25 years ago, I turned it back into a house. Nowadays, my major interest on the farm is the Charley cattle. My son Dan and I have a pedigree herd. We send breeding animals all over Britain, often the best going to Scotland, and some abroad when the opportunity arises. Our acreage has gone from 200 when I first began to 800. And we've had to expand where land was available. So we're rather scattered, and it's quite a job to get round and see it all. The price of land has been going up all the while, very slowly at first, accelerating after the war, and absolutely rocketing in the 60s. In this semi-residential area, the national trend has been exaggerated. So now, the capital value of a farm has little or no relationship to its annual yield. If I wasn't so interested in using the land for agriculture, which is ingrained into me. I really ought to be thinking about using it for perhaps for leisure purposes. Perhaps at Dungrove, which is a lovely spot, we should have a golf course. But I wouldn't want to live here if we did. I should want to go somewhere else and find a place to farm. Whereas I own my farm, Dan rents his from the church. The ownership of land doesn't interest me at all. The ownership of land is unimportant to anybody unless they're thinking about money. Then it becomes something in the bank to sell should times come hard or if you change your mind. My res responsibility to the countryside is that I'm a steward. I'm not here for very long. Um, I must look after it. I must also make a living out of it. The use of the land is important to the farmer and I'm quite happy to be a tenant. I'd rather be a tenant using the church's money, then I would be um, a landowner with perhaps on this farm 800,000 pounds of my money tied up, earning a very small amount. If we look at the, the assets that we use on this farm, um, it may be as much as two million pounds, the total assets. We get a small return, relatively speaking. If we were to give up, and have all those assets turned into cash. Uh, not that they're all ours, some of the assets belong to my landlord, but if we were to use those proportion of assets for spending money, then we would be wealthy. There are plenty of rich farmers. They're rich the day they give up. It seemed to me dangerous and undesirable that now it's nearly impossible for new people to get into farming. Annual production at £300 an acre is a poor return on land purchased at £2,000 an acre. Ben Boughton is a leading light in the National Farmers Union and has strong opinions on this. The young farmer just started, either bought his farm at a high price and perhaps also with a big overdraft. He will find times very difficult indeed when grain prices drop. The long established farmer with no overdraft, owning his farm, no mortgage, he'll survive with very considerable price cuts and it'll be very unfortunate if we keep the old men in business and the young men can't make a living. Our own family situation puts it in pretty dramatic contrast. My farm I bought after the war for somewhat less than 40 pounds an acre and I've no mortgage on it. Dan's farm was rented last year at £40 an acre. So his annual rent is as much as my capital cost. And we get exactly the same amount for the corn grown on one farm as we do for the corn grown on the other farm. Exactly the same amount. And in the 20s, wheat was £5 a tonne. Now it's gone up to over 100. But the real price has gone down. The sale of one tonne used to pay one man's wages for three weeks. Now it only pays one week. But it's still our major crop. The market 
always decided what you grew. The way you market is decided by what transport's available to you. In primitive times, when the method of transport was a horse and cart, you must have concentrated on what you could use locally and what you could sell locally and try to produce a wide range of products for local population. The first big change in transport in this area would have been the canal coming to Berkhamsted. And as soon as that canal was there, you could send things into London, things that kept. And they started off by sending in things like cheese, but also cows, because they travelled better than the milk did. The milk would be produced fresh in backyards in London. But then the railway came soon afterwards, and the railway being much faster, you could then start sending fresh milk into London. Now, of course, the method of transport is the plane or the fast lorry and the big tanker, and so you've got an ever-widening market, therefore everybody has got down to specialisation, and it is dangerous producing just one or two things, and all of a sudden nobody wants it very much. So right now at the moment, we're, we're really looking into, this, into this diversification because we feel under threat. So long as the barley and wheat market were guaranteed and good and rape was developing all the time, we didn't feel under threat. Now we hear every day, every week of our lives about surpluses and that the price will be down further next year. There is no way that the EC is going to limit production by price restraint without causing an enormous upset in the countryside. And that upset is not acceptable to any of the political parties in this country. So ultimately, they will have to have quotas. Then they have to use spies in the sky or whatever to check that we only grow that acreage which we're allowed to grow. Since the war, we've had an almost unparalleled length of time where farmers have been in a secure financial world. I, don't, I can't recall from my history that there have been 45 years where people have been secure in agriculture. I mean, historically it goes up and down. I think now we're heading towards a down and surviving in it may prove difficult. Days gone by, if the corn market wasn't good, you changed over just a bit to livestock. But now the meat market is fully supplied. There's constant propaganda against eating red meat, so we're unlikely to be able to increase uh, 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 the market for red meat. In addition to that, the pig and poultry men have become technically so very, very efficient with factory or semi-factory farming that they can produce white meat very much cheaper than you can produce red meat. So for the ordinary general farmer, there are not so many alternatives available as there used to be. So naturally, we've had to open up our mind to new ideas. To survive, some farmers have turned to contracting. One local family, the Newmans, who have been in small farms for four generations, instead of buying extra land, have bought big machines. They do their own harvest and then work for us and other neighbours. A combine at £50,000 is not an economic for us to buy, so we contract out. There'll be more of that in the future. As a byproduct of the enormous increase in grain production in the last few years, there is a huge surplus of straw. All the straw used to be used on farms by the cattle, horses and the rest of it and returned to the land. Well, now we produce so much more, it wouldn't be possible. People would never eat enough meat to warrant the keeping of all those cattle. So the next thing which is required of the scientists by us is a means of using all this vast quantity of cellular material, the straw, which we're criticised for burning, but somebody will have to invent a way of using it. It's the first time we've tried this on our farm. The idea is to treat the straw with ammonia to make it more easily digestible for the cattle. The ammonia breaks down the fibre in the straw and it's only a matter of days before it can be used as a substitute for hay. Another potential outlet for straw is fuel. If it could be compressed into a dense enough state, it would be very useful, with about the same calorific value as coal. We can advance as far as scientists will enable us. Perhaps the most advanced bit of science we use on our farm is embryo transplants. These white Charlet calves were born to brown Guernsey mothers. By the process of transplantation of developing embryos at about eight days old, 
we were able to have had in the last four years 11 calves from the one cow and by normal process the best we could have done is four or five calves. The Guernseys can't tell the difference. As far as they know, they had a calf which they believed to be theirs and they take to them just as they would their own. With all the scientific and engineering changes, some things don't change. Calves are born as they always have been. And when an animal starts to give birth, she's got to be watched. That's not much. Come on, girl. Come on. Most calves are born quite easily. With 70 a year, we get one or two difficult ones. This one wasn't going to come by itself. We had to act quickly. No time to get the vet. But Dan's been doing this job for very many years. Once calving has started, the quicker it's done within reason, the better for the cow and the calf, which must breathe straight away. Uh, that point up, Miss Bell. Up. up. We thought we were going to lose this one. And so, because she'd got plenty of milk, we brought another very new calf onto her. And she took to it. Within an hour, they were both all right. Just as with animals, the land needs what it's always needed. Now lime is quarried with big machines. 70 years ago, it was horses and carts. 200 years ago, it was pulled up in buckets and wheeled in barrows. Today, fertilizers are the big issue. In fact, we're doing the same things to the soil as we've always done, but more intensively. Part of the current interest in farming concentrates on the idea that we should be farming organically. That is to say, what comes out of land should be returned to the land. And people forget that it wasn't farmers who went away from organic farming and started using chemicals. It was the urban population who, in order to protect itself from epidemics, particularly from cholera, introduced regulations whereby the organic waste products of urban areas could not be used in farming. I believe that there should be very strict control of the chemicals used on the farm. And I think the control should be um, exerted before it gets to the marketplace, so that products which are, generally speaking, um, they may be of benefit to the farmer, but that are dangerous to the wildlife, should not be used. There's enough in the armory without those. In times gone by, human beings ate the produce of their land and they returned all the waste products to that land. And I understand that in other parts of the world, in particular China, that's still the way that it's done. And they have a viable system of agriculture that way. In this country, we lost that as a result of public health acts. I remember hearing a, a small story from Scotland one day, which illustrates the position. A farmer that I know ha had, down the end of his drive, a small farmer in a very bad farm. And this man had worked for years and years trying to improve his farm. And when he wasn't doing anything else, they all saw him picking up stones. One day they went by and they called out, still picking up stones, Angus? And he said, yes, Mr. Adam, I was just thinking to myself, if all the millions of people from Glasgow had come out to my farm at the weekend, and they would have a shit and pick up a stone, I should have the best farm in Scotland when they'd done. And that's it. You improve your land by working on it and returning fertility to it. It's how the land is used that always produces conflict. Conflicts about enclosure. Conflicts about removing the enclosure hedges. The effects of this are long term, and that's how it should be looked at. I think, as it is now, we've got to think in terms of, uh, of conserving and improving and not 
merely preserving and freezing, which is different in my mind. We've got to think constructively about the countryside, adapting modern methods so that they don't spoil the countryside, not preventing people doing productive things because they threaten the countryside, but thinking how they can be done simultaneously with not threatening the countryside. This is Cowcroft Wood. It's a perfect example of what the countryside does given half a chance and looked at over a long period. It's grown up naturally over 300 years. Now it's full of all sorts of things. But just from here, you can see a tremendous variety of trees and shrubs. I can see there a beech with behind it, a, a maple, a hornbeam, an oak, a whole lot of ashes, a cherry, uh, an elderberry, a hazelnut, every sort of tree and shrub that grows anywhere in the south of England has populated this particular bit of ground because people have left it alone and didn't try to plant something. In fact, this is an abandoned industrial site. Bricks were made from Tudor times onwards. They dug a pit and used the clay, then moved on to another spot and began again. Even the last hole to become overgrown. Holes 200 years old and more are still identifiable in the wood. Eventually, the site covered 30 acres. The last small quarry was abandoned only nine years ago. And so the scars left to heal naturally have become beauty spots. Brick making is still going on right next door. The same clay, the same bricks, but burnt now in an oil-fired kiln, not with logs and brushwood as they were. Sometimes they're still made by hand and used in old buildings to match what's there. Now, of course, they're very expensive. The same rules apply to any other business as to farming. Most things now are done by machines, with fewer men producing more. Crops are taken from the ground but replace themselves. Clay too comes from the ground, but unlike a crop cannot be recreated. It seems to me that man has to use what's there, but he doesn't have to spoil his world in doing it. Immediately the digging stops, the plants start to grow. Nature reasserts itself, and once again, what was an ugly scar becomes an interesting feature. Now rubbish fills the abandoned holes because the law says you must restore the levels of the land. Modern society produces a lot of rubbish and it's a handy way of getting rid of it. This pit too would have become a beauty spot if it had been left alone. As soon as the pit is full and covered with soil, it can go back to agriculture. This wheat field of ours is an old rubbish tip where the last clay for Cowcroft Brickworks was dug. Cowcroft Wood, Brickworks, the Rubbish Tip and the Restored Wheat Field are all together in one spot. Man's activities have created the countryside and the same thing is happening everywhere in Britain. Unlike Cowcroft, which arose naturally, most woods in the Chilterns were created quite deliberately. These beech woods are really an 18th century crop which has never been fully harvested. They were planted or encouraged then to supply the local timber industry and Tessaman in High Wycombe, the furniture industry, and left themselves, they'd all die at the same time because they're senile. But you can uh, perpetuate them by cutting out patches and leaving a few tall trees which will seed like this by my feet or, and will also give protection for uh, young trees that you can plant in the patches. 
and that perpetuates the wood from, forever because when the young ones grow a little bit bigger, the old ones can be taken out. This is long-term management of the land. For me, the result is beautiful, and it's beauty created by a commercial operation, timber growing. The trees in the hedgerows aren't there by chance either. Somebody planted them as well. Oaks to maintain wooden buildings, and elms for coffins. Sometimes the trees have been left when the hedges were taken out and show where the old field boundaries were. Hedges have always been a source of trouble. Arguments between farmers to where precisely they should be. Riots when they were planted long ago. Letters to the papers when they're taken out. When all the work was done by hand, they had to be cut at a height a man could reach. When we got modern machinery, we still cut low out of habit. Recently, I realized that with a long reach of mechanical hedge cutters, we could have them as high as we want to leave a better habitat for the birds and more nesting sites. And I think there are other ways in which farmers can improve the appearance of the countryside. We are planting trees in odd corners of the farm, on land which is not so good, or in small irregular pieces which are difficult for modern machinery. Soon, Grove Farm will have more woodland than it ever had before. There will be a good environment for both birds and animals to replace the hedges I've removed. When I look round the countryside as it is now, I feel nostalgic like everybody else does. And sometimes I regret what I've done and sometimes I am proud of what I've done. Proud of producing more food and regret perhaps changing the countryside. But it's not all lost. There's an awful lot of uh, uh, beautiful things left behind. And if we look at it positively, we can create more beauty again wherever we want to or allow it to create itself. We mustn't take a negative attitude. And, uh, Above everything else, you mustn't freeze it precisely the way it is. It is not in the best state it's ever been. And even 40 years ago, it wasn't in the best state it's ever been. Don't freeze it at any one point. Think constructively and positively about preserving the countryside, and you can make it even better than it's ever been. When I was seven years old, this was a wood. My father cut it down, and foxgloves sprang up. Then trees grew, and the foxgloves disappeared. They left their seeds behind, and when I cut another crop of trees down the year before last, there were the foxgloves again, ready to take over from the trees. The seeds of the past are there to create the future in everything we do.